What in the world makes us so embarrassed about the gospel? For I determined to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. Pilate was hated by the Jews. He was hated by them because of things like putting up idols, their, from their perspective, in their buildings. But what is interesting about Pilate here to me is that he repeatedly declares that Jesus is not guilty. I find no fault in him three times, three times he pronounces him not guilty. And the man didn't get to the position he had by not having a sense of justice. He did have a sense of justice. He wanted to stand on justice. He wanted to maintain his legal ground. He wanted to do what was fit for a man of that dignified position. He wanted to do what would prove to the people who were above him that he was an honorable man. He wanted to treat Jesus in a just fashion. Justice is no threat to Him. Jesus is certainly no threat to Him or to Rome, but I'll tell you who is a threat to Him. The Jews are. They make His knees knock. They make Him shake. Here's why. On His first visit to Jerusalem, He came into town wanting to make a big show, and He came with this massive entourage of soldiers, and they were carrying banners and standards, and on the banners and standards were the busts of Caesar with an eagle. Caesar was considered a deity, and the Jews saw this as an idol. By the way, all previous governors from the historical records, all previous governors avoided such offenses, but Pilate was this brash, bold, proud man, adamant in refusing to remove the displays. He returned from Jerusalem with his banners back to Caesarea, and the people followed him. And what happened was when they got to Caesarea, the record says they harassed him for five days to remove the idols. Finally, in frustration, he told the people to meet in the amphitheater in Caesarea. And they came. And he surrounded the people who had followed him with his soldiers, and he informed them that if they didn't stop the harassment on the spot, they would all be massacred in that amphitheater by the Roman soldiers. The Jews pulled their collars down and bared their necks and said, go ahead and massacre us. They called his bluff. And he removed all the images, and they had won. A second thing got him in trouble with the Jews. Now, the Jerusalem water supply was inadequate, so Pilate determined to build an aqueduct, and he took the money out of the temple treasury. That's supposed to be money that's Corbin devoted to God. So the people rioted. And Pilate sent men into the rioting Jewish crowd at a given signal, and they clubbed and stabbed these Jewish people to death, and a massacre took place. This just added to their hatred of this man. And when he was in Jerusalem, he lived in that Hasmonean Herodian palace. And that's where he put up the shields in honor of Tiberius Caesar and other persons that were honored by having their names on the shield and refused to remove them until they went to Rome and protested and Caesar forced him to do it. He hated the Jews. In the thirteenth chapter of Luke, in the opening five verses, it says he sent some of his men into the temple where some... Jewish people were making sacrifice, and they took their knives and slaughtered all the people who were making sacrifices in the temple. This is Pilate. He was called back to Rome 
In 36 A.D., he was exiled to Gaul and he killed himself, according to Josephus. Pilate now is in a very precarious place in our scene because he knows that he has failed so many times in dealing with the Jews and he's afraid if they report him to Caesar again, he is really done and they remind him of that. We will tell Caesar if you don't do what we want. You're no friend of Caesar. Trying to hang on to justice, he makes an appeal which is recorded in the twenty-third chapter of Luke. He said to them, "'You brought this man to Me as one who incites the people to rebellion. And behold, having examined him before you, I found no guilt in this man regarding the charges which you make against him, nor has Herod, for he sent him back to us. And behold, nothing deserving death has been done by him. Therefore, how's this for a conclusion? Therefore, I will punish him and release him.' Punish him for what? You just said he didn't do anything. I will punish him unjustly, illegally, cowardly, and then release him. Wouldn't you be satisfied with that if I just lash him? Now we pick up the story in Mark 15 again. At the feast, he used to release for them. This is phase three. Pilate, phase one. Herod, phase two. Back to Pilate, phase three. He used to release for them any one prisoner whom they requested. And this was a kind of a way to conciliate with an occupied people. Amnesty. Amnesty for one prisoner of the people's choice. By the way, ancient sources say this was a provision of goodwill that the Roman governors did in a lot of places to try to, to maintain some sense of uh, mercy. And he was sure, I think, that the people would want Jesus. After all, Jesus was the miracle worker. So he's done with the Sanhedrin. He's not going to deal with them anymore. They're, they're, they're incorrigible. But now he's going to turn to the population and he feels he's on pretty safe ground finally here because of what happened on Monday when Jesus came in and they hailed Him as their King. So he's going to move away from the vicious, unjust leaders and he's going to address the people who have been given the privilege uh, on occasions like this at the Passover to choose a prisoner to be released and to receive amnesty. The man named Barabbas, verse 7, uh, was his choice as an option. He had been imprisoned with the insurrectionists who had committed murder in the insurrection. By the way, Barabbas means son of the father. Bar Abbas, Abba is Papa, Bar is son of. This is the son of the father offered in the place of the divine son of the divine father. This man is a robber. Here he is a murderer, he is a revolutionary, he is called uh, by Luke a notable prisoner, well known, surely headed for crucifixion and they didn't wait. The Romans didn't wait. Crucifixion came fast. The insurrection must have been very, very, very near. It just happened in a matter of days before perhaps. Insurrections, by the way, like this and revolts were not unusual as one of these in 66 that led to the destruction of Jerusalem in the year 70 A.D. Barabbas probably, well, let's just say maybe, was the one who should have been on the middle cross with the other two who may well have been partners in this insurrection. Pilate thinks maybe this is going to be the way out, turn to the people. The crowd went up, verse 8, and began asking Him to do as He had been accustomed to do for them. Hey, it's the Passover, release a prisoner. Gathering in the early morning, attracted by the uh, public proceedings regarding Jesus, this thing begins to gather a crowd in the early hours. They come before Pilate. They want what they're entitled to by precedent, so Pilate 
answers them in verse 9 and says, do you want me to release for you the king of the Jews? There's so much scorn in that. He is a man full of bitterness, guilt, hate. Let history record that this pagan knew Jesus was innocent of all charges. And he gives the people of Israel the choice to stop the corrupt efforts of the Sanhedrin and to have Jesus released. He turns to the people, expecting the response, yes, we want Jesus, the great teacher, the greatest teacher ever, the miracle worker. We want Jesus. And the reason he thought he was on safe ground is in verse 10, very interesting verse. He was aware the chief priests had handed him over because of envy. That's correct. That's the, if you're looking for a motive here, there it is. They were jealous. I told you that a few weeks ago. They were jealous of His power. They were jealous of His popularity. They were jealous of His teaching. They hated Him because of envy, and He knew that. And he was sure it was the envy of the leaders that made them the way they were. And if he went to the people, it would be different because the people had hailed him as their king and their Messiah. There's a little incident that occurs at this time also recorded by Matthew in Matthew 27 and verse 19. While he was sitting on the judgment seat, his wife sent him a message saying, have nothing to do with that righteous man, for last night I suffered greatly in a dream because of him." <laughs> you know, people in, in pagan worlds believe in dreams and the seriousness of dreams. Well, was this a divine revelation? No. This was just absolute fear on the part of his wife transferred into a dream. Don't have anything to do with this righteous man, for last night I suffered greatly in a dream because of him. Listen to this, but the chief priests and the elders persuaded the crowds to ask for Barabbas and to put Jesus to death. In the middle of all of this, he gets a note from his wife. And while he's considering this concern of his wife, the Sanhedrin is moving in the crowd, and they're stirring up the crowd, and they effectively persuaded the crowd to ask for Barabbas and to put Jesus to death. So when the governor said to them, which of the two do you want me to release for you, they said, Barabbas. Her fears showed up in her dreams as fears do. She is another witness to the innocence of Jesus, have nothing to do with this righteous man. While Pilate is conversing with his wife, the Sanhedrin is turning the mob. And we pick it up again in verse 11 of Mark 15, the chief priest stirred up the crowd to ask Him to release Barabbas for them instead. It's unthinkable. What did Barabbas ever do for anybody? What good was Barabbas? And yet Luke says they all together declared they wanted Barabbas. In fact, in Luke 23, 18, it, it's recorded that they said, away with this man and release Barabbas, release Barabbas. Let the guilty live, kill the sinless one. Treat the guilty as innocent and treat the innocent as guilty. So now they render their verdict on Jesus and in the reality of it that Jesus renders His verdict on them. And Luke says, Pilate wanting to release Jesus still addresses the crowd again, verse 12, Pilate said to them, then what shall I do with Him whom you call the King of the Jews? What do I do with Him? Verse 13, they shouted back, crucify Him. That's the crowd. They have been led into this hysteria by the Sanhedrin. It's really hard to understand, isn't it, from Monday to Friday? They join the rest of the corrupt blasphemers. They take their place with Judas and Annas and Caiaphas and Herod and Pilate and the Sanhedrin. And Pilate, still incredulous, verse 14, said to them, why? What evil has he done? Another declaration of innocence, another one. 
but the crowd is relentless. They shouted all the more, crucify Him. That's an amazing Passover day, isn't it? <laughs> they were there that day to honor God uh, with a Passover meal. This was the high point of worship for them. They were there to bring their sacrifices before God, to show their obedience to God. They were there to eat the, the, the commemorative meal that remembered the deliverance of God, the goodness of God, the mercy of God that brought them out of slavery in Egypt. They were remembering God and His goodness while at the same time screaming for the death of the Son of God. Pilate's finished, done in, and he collapses under the threat. He has to bow to their will. And the first line in verse 15 is an amazing statement, wishing to satisfy the crowd. How's that for an epitaph? Pilate, who wished to satisfy the crowd. Write that in stone over his life. It's a despicable thing. Over and over and over he declares the innocence of Jesus. But he released Barabbas for them, and after having Jesus scourged, he handed him over to be crucified. So he adjudicates his final decision after having Jesus scourged. He handed Him over to be crucified. Matthew says the screams for Jesus to be crucified were so strong and so relentless. Matthew 27, 24, that Pilate feared a riot was starting, a riot. And Matthew writes this, Matthew 27, verse 25, and all the people said, His blood be on us and our children. Hmm. They took full responsibility for the murder of Jesus. Little wonder that the Lord destroyed that city and that nation in 70 A.D., is it? Little wonder that that nation remains under judgment to this very day until they repent and come to Christ, which many Jews do individually and one day in the future will do nationally scourged. What does it mean to be scourged? It means to be um, whipped, flogged is another term that could express that. Whips, um, a wooden handle, long thongs embedded in the ends of the thongs would be pieces of bone, sharp pieces of bone and stone and iron, massive blood loss. Many people died. There would be two lictors alternating blows. He was handed over to be scourged. This is such an ugly experience. It was done, and not only as a form of punishment, but to speed up death on the cross. Otherwise, people could linger for a long time, and the blood loss sped up the reality of death. In John 19, we get a more detailed account of this. The soldiers twisted John 19.2 together a crown of thorns, put it on his head, put a purple robe on him, began to come up to him and say, Hail, King of the Jews. The comedy continues, the irony, the sarcasm, the mockery, the scorn, and they gave him slaps in the face like they had seen the Sanhedrin do. Pilate came out again and said to them, Behold, I'm bringing him out to you so that you may know that I find no guilt in him. This is after the scourging. He brings him back. Jesus came out this time wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe the soldiers had put on him in mockery. And Pilate said, Behold the man. Take a look at him. Is that not enough? 
So when the chief priests and the officers saw Him, they cried out, saying, Crucify! Crucify! Pilate said to them, Take Him yourselves and crucify Him, for I find no guilt in Him. And the Jews answered, We have a law, and by that law He ought to die because He made Himself out to be the Son of God. And now they forget the tax issue and they forget the king issue and they forget the perverting of the nation and they come to the blasphemy. He has to die because He said He's the Son of God. Therefore when Pilate heard this statement, he was even more afraid. And he entered into the praetorium again and said to Jesus, "'Where are you from?' Jesus gave him no answer. Pilate said to him, "'You don't speak to Me. Do you not know that I have authority to release you and I have authority to crucify you?' Jesus answered, "'You would have no authority over Me unless it had been given you from above. For this reason He who delivered Me to you has the greater sin.'" As a result of this, Pilate made efforts to release Him. But the Jews cried out, saying, "'If you release this man, you are no friend of Caesar.'" Everyone who makes himself out to be a king opposes Caesar. Now he knew if they went to Caesar again on his behalf, he was history. When he heard these words, he brought Jesus out, sat down on the judgment seat at a place called the pavement in Hebrew, Gabbatha. It was the day of preparation for the Passover, the sixth hour. Six a.m. in the morning when this ends, likely. And He said to the Jews, Behold your King. And they cried out, Away with Him, away with Him, crucify Him. Pilate said to them, Shall I crucify your King? The chief priests answered, We have no king but Caesar. So He handed Him over to be crucified. How could this happen? Well, one answer is because man is so totally wretched, but the other answer is because God is so totally merciful. Here we see the worst of men and the best of God. He is bruised for our iniquities, isn't He, as Isaiah 53 says. Rabbi Ben Ezra, contemplating what happened that day in history, wrote this, and I quote from him, he's addressing Jesus, you, if you were Messiah who at midnight watch came by starlight naming a dubious name, and if too heavy with spiritual sleep, too rash with fear. O oh, you Messiah, if that martyr gash fell on you, coming to take your people, and we gave you the cross when we owed you the throne, you be the judge." Hmm. He is the judge. And they have been judged, and so will all be who reject Christ. Father, as we have uh, looked into this text, there's so much here, so much drama, so much that captures our mind and our fascination, more than we can even absorb in an hour like this. We're so deeply grateful that You have given us such a complete record, such marvelous, interwoven eyewitnesses and records by the writers of the Gospels so that we know exactly what happened. We understand the reason for all of this was not so that the wickedness of man could be on display, that's on display all the time, but so that the love of You, our great God, for sinners could be on display. For He died for us pleased You to crush Him, to bruise Him for us. He took our place, bore all of this for us. How wonderful, how incomprehensible. We can't understand how men could do this. 
but even more, we can't understand how You, a holy God, could do this to Your Son. Oh, how much You love Your Son that You would do this to Him in order that You might provide for Him an everlasting and eternal bride, a redeemed humanity to praise and serve Him forever and ever. We glory in this reality in the cross with all its horrors. We embrace the cross and we find there love demonstrated at its highest level. We thank You that we've experienced that through the work of the Holy Spirit, bringing us to regeneration, repentance and saving faith. And we give You praise and glory in Your Son's name. Amen.